Hi, welcome to church. My name is Amelia. I'm so glad that you're here to worship with us this weekend. I've got a few announcements before we get started with today's service. First off, the Grace app has gotten a huge makeover this week, so some of your favorite things may have moved around, but it's still where you can find today's message notes, you can find links to stream, links to give, you can find our full media library, our live group content, links to sign up to serve, links to take next steps, all kinds of good stuff on the Grace app. If you've not downloaded it yet, you can get it for free on whatever app store for whatever device you're using. Also on the Grace app, you can get more information about the pathway. The pathway is our process here at Grace that helps us identify where we are on our faith journey and what some of our next steps may be. If you'd like more info about the pathway, you can find it again on the Grace app or on our website under the About Us tab. Grace Kids is open down the hall for ages six weeks old up through fifth grade. Grace Kids are learning all about making waves this summer. What you do today can change the world around you. If you are joining us from home, we also have an online kids experience available on our Grace app or on our YouTube channel. And Celebrate Recovery is happening here this Friday. Celebrate Recovery is a great place for recovery journeys for all kinds of hurts, hangups, and habits. We'd love to see you here this Friday at six. And for 6th through 12th graders, we have a Grace Student Night happening this Sunday night, and we also have a lot of Grace Student Night hangouts on Fridays coming up this summer. You can get all the info for that by visiting the Grace app and clicking What's Happening. You can also get more info on the Grace Student Instagram account. Following the Sunday service this weekend, we'll be having a congregational business meeting where we will be discussing an exciting opportunity that the church has. Everyone is welcome to attend this meeting. Again, that's happening after our Sunday service this weekend. Pastor Jamie is going to be bringing the message in today's service. We'll be hearing a message from our Gentle Savior in a Harsh World series, and we'll be discussing that message even further in our life groups this week. If you're not in a life group yet and you're interested, you've got questions about life group, we have a life group fair coming up August 6th and 7th. It'll be before and after the services. We'll have members from each life group present where you can meet them. You can get more info about their groups, find a group that's right for you, find a few that you'd like to try out. We'd love to have you join us for that the weekend of August 6th and 7th before and after the services. If you're a guest with us here this weekend, we're so thrilled that you're here. We would love to get to know you and find out if you've got any questions about our church that we can answer. Also, if you have anything that we can be praying for you about, we would love to pray for you this week. You can scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you and click I'm a guest. If you're watching from home, you can do that same thing by texting Grace Guest one word to 84576. We would love to connect with you on social media this week. We post all kinds of fun content there during the week like this. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. If you've got your phone out or if you're watching online already, we'd love it if you'd share today's service. It's the easiest way to share the gospel this week. It's going to be a great weekend here at Grace. Enjoy the service. Well, good evening, everybody. Come on, let's stand up. What a privilege it is to come together as God's children and give him the praise that he deserves tonight. Come on, let's lift this up together. Sing it out. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It wasn't my turn Till I met you You called my name
passion was heavy, but chains break at the wind of glory. I need a shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. Where I was broken, you were my healing, now you're Take a moment, focus your attention to the baptistry. All right. Yeah, this way, please, over here. Uh, man, listen, if you can uh, set through that song and not have a smile on your face, you need to see me after class. All right? So, and I love the message in that for uh, Pastor Joel, for salvation. But every time you guys sing that, I also think about, as the psalmist says, when the, the pangs of death had a hold of me in a different way. And uh, man, when he calls our name, he can get us out. So anyway, praise the Lord for that. I'm going to step into the light as they're showing me here in the back. There we go, guys. I got, a, I got one of these and then the double thumbs up, so I'm all right now. <laughs> Very good. Well, we, um, if you're a regular attender here and member, you know that uh, once a month we take a weekend and we, uh, we have a baptism service for all those who are taking that step uh, in their life, and we have a few people this weekend doing that. Two ladies tonight uh, are going to be following the Lord in believers' baptism, and we often say this to them, whether in the class or we meet with somebody. But it's really, it's really the first opportunity you have to um, uh, to preach without preaching a message. You're just just demonstrating this that Jesus came, and that He died, was buried, and rose again. And they're saying, "I believe this. I testify to this, and I'm also." Now, I know I believe this, but I'm dying to myself, and I'm buried with Christ and raised in newness of life with Him. So, uh, hey, we celebrate that here at Grace Fellowship Church. We want to celebrate everybody who takes next steps in these things. So, Pastor Caleb, uh, I'll let you take it from here and introduce who we have, okay? Well, hey, everybody. Isn't it exciting to be part of a baptism weekend? Amen. Amen. Well, this is, this is Karen, and I actually got to meet Karen for the first time uh, here in the back, and it was uh, such a privilege because as I sat and talked to her, she said, I just said, I said, what brought you to the decision to be baptized? And she said, uh, I, I was just completely broken. I was completely broken in March 2nd, correct? M March 2nd. And she said, and I just decided I'm going to surrender everything to Jesus. Amen? And she said, I'm just, yeah, yeah, you can, you can give her a round of applause. And she said, I want to be baptized today so that I can just demonstrate all that Jesus Christ has done for me and so that I can uh, represent that. And so maybe that's your testimony out there, uh, that you were completely broken and uh, you decided to surrender everything, but this is your next step. Uh, let her testimony challenge you. So Karen, it's extremely exciting for me to be able to baptize you. Have you believed, uh, do you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, and have you accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior? Well, then it's with great privilege that I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everybody, this is Kaylee. Give her a hand as she's getting in the baptismal pool. <laughs> I'm going to have you scoot a little bit forward. 
and, and like Karen, I, I met Kaylee for the first time tonight, and uh, as she was talking to me, she said, you know, I always grew up around God. I grew up in, in a home where I, I kind of was around God, and she said, when I was 11, right, 11, 11, uh, I made the decision to follow Jesus Christ as my, as my Lord and Savior, and I, I surrendered to him, but she said, I haven't been baptized. And so she said, I knew that this is a decision that I had to make. And uh, let me also say that there's probably a number of people who are sitting and can resonate with her testimony where you made a decision maybe when you were a, a kid to follow Jesus and you accepted him as your Lord and Savior, uh, but you have not taken this step. Let her testimony challenge you uh, in, in her walk with Christ. So, Kaylee, uh, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes. And have you accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior? Well, then it's a great privilege that I get to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Well, welcome again, church. What a joy to uh, be able to start a weekend off this way. And uh, give these ladies another hand for just being able to do that. So. If you are new to our church, uh, as a guest, we welcome you, especially tonight. Uh, my name is Roy Mack. I'm the senior pastor. If I hadn't got a chance to uh, meet you, I hope to do so after the service and uh, get up with you. And if you are a first-time guest or a guest that's been coming a little bit but haven't really tried to connect with us at all, uh, let me encourage you to do something tonight. There's a QR code that's going to be on the screens behind me or they're on some of the seat backs that are in front of you, and if you would just open up your camera app, hold it up to that, and click the button that comes up just as simple as one, two, three, and you'll scroll just a second, and you'll see I am a guest, and that is a way to just get in the flow of information. It's not a, a, a deal where we're going to be bugging you or bothering you, but we would just love to be able to connect with you in the way that um, you would like to be connected with. So if you have a question about any of the ministries here or anything about uh, the church, a uh, good way to connect, just get in the flow of information with that. And then you'll also see, as it says, I'm a guest, but I have a prayer request. And I know this, it's usually uh, a need that's in someone's heart and life. I, it, it took me a few years to figure this out. That's usually the reason you come to church. I'm 33 years into this. I know this, all right? A lot of people have come to church because a need brought them here. And we would be privileged to pray with you about whatever it is that you're carrying, uh, some burden. Our staff meets every week on Tuesday morning, and we generally uh, open up with prayer and finish with prayer, praying for those requests. Thursday morning, about 7 in the morning, I meet with usually about 7 or, or 8 of our elders. We'll make that prayer meeting time, Bible study time together. We pray for the needs that come in also at that time. So just know this, if you have something that you would mind sharing and you don't have to tell all the details of something but just say hey here's my name and here's something that I'm carrying just know it'll be lifted up several times this week and we'll ask the Lord to meet that need in your heart and life and we would love to hear from you when God answers prayer all right it's what encouragement to us who are praying that way so just want to encourage you to do that and also if you're just a, a, a regular attender member here Great weights for you to also, you can go on there and share a prayer request as well. Uh, so we encourage you to do that. Many of you take advantage of that every week. I uh, want to, um, for, just don't forget it, tomorrow after the Sunday, after the Sunday service tomorrow, we have a specially called business meeting about an opportunity that's come up uh, for our church. The normal thing we do here is once a year have an annual meeting, vote on the budget. Most of the business kind of things are done. Uh, that way periodically uh, in a church like ours are growing and doing and different things things just crop up and this is one of those things that's just cropped up uh, it's all good news all good things but uh, if you would like to be a part of that and know about that uh, 15 minutes after the service tomorrow I realize that many of you are worshiping here tonight and uh, so you can't be tomorrow but it, some of you might want to come back after the service tomorrow uh, give it about 15 minutes and we'll be right into that. It should be a short meeting. Also, next week, uh, we're going to be having uh, communion together here as a church, which is always a, a wonderful time together. And that means that if you know someone who's a shut-in or would like to participate in communion with us but can't get out, 
you can pick up uh, kind of communion to go, if you would. Uh, put that in their hands and ask them to watch uh, on the internet with us next week. And we will always try to recognize those who are having communion with us uh, so they can feel a part in doing that as well. Uh, Amelia mentioned last week we have uh, our Israel trip next, next year. This would be April something right at the end of there. It is like magic. It pops up April 24th to May 2nd. Uh, we have uh, 48 slots of people going to Israel. We have, as of today, I think there is eight spots left. Normally you'd say it this way, that's like four couples, so that's not many. We will have a few on a wait list because I know this, again, from 30-something years of leading things like this. Things come up, somebody has a health issue, some reasons can't go, whatever the case may be. And it, it really gets serious by putting names on tickets and so forth about January, but we need you to go ahead and deposit because I signed a contract yesterday for the flights and all that stuff. So don't have to have names yet for that part, but in order to reserve it and get the tickets right and get all the things we needed to do, it's there. So if you're interested, go on the app, the, the newly remodeled app, if you hear, heard the announcements, awesome, just go take a look at that. Um, sign up on, under that or get the information or ask the questions that you need to. Well, tonight we're going to be continuing uh, our series on Gentle Savior in a Harsh World. Man, that's quite a title, isn't it? We have a gentle Savior and we're living in such a, such a harsh world. And we are blessed tonight to get to hear from uh, Pastor Jamie. Pastor Jamie Winters is our kids pastor here, family pastor. And um, many of you know that I've been the pastor here for nine years. Pastor Jamie's been here uh, seven, five. Time's getting away. Five years, five years. But I've been knowing Jamie 15 years probably, somewhere, maybe longer, uh, because he worked for... A good pastor friend of mine when we were all in the Atlanta area together so we have a we have a lot of history with one another and this is what I know uh, pastor Jamie is a not just a, a good preacher he's a good man he's a good man amen so blessed that we have him here uh, I'm so thankful for he and Jody and grace and the work that they do on a weekly basis I hear people say particularly people who have children in our uh, our kids area uh, just what a blessing that Pastor Jamie is and uh, I just want you to know he's been that as long as I've known him just a, a faithful good servant of the Lord and you'll be blessed by his pulpit ministry tonight uh, the staff and I have uh, done not that we've studied together but we've worked through some of the same books together and I know the subject that he's going to be speaking on tonight I'm a little jealous that I don't get to talk about it because it's one of my favorite pieces of this of this whole series so let me encourage you to do this if you're relatively new with us or if you're someone who's not downloaded our church app download the app because all the notes are going to be right there easy to find uh, many of you talk about because I hear from you how you go back through them after uh, all the messages do your devotions with them you're in life groups together talking about them but get that so you'll have it for you tonight. What a great, great message. I'm putting pressure on him now. It's going to be one of the best messages he's ever preached. It's going to happen right here on the platform tonight. All right. Well, uh, also, if you're a regular tender member here, uh, you know there's uh, three ways to give at least. And uh, we always try to emphasize that in this part of the service. And we're going to pray for the offering here in just a moment. We can give online, in person or you can text and do it that way. And thank you so much for being faithful in that. Uh, of all the things that pastors have to worry about, I praise the Lord that it's been a long time since I had to worry about church finances. You guys are so faithful in your giving, and I praise the Lord for that. And um, yeah, that's it. Just give the, give the Lord a hand and your faithfulness to that. And I know that's individualistic, you know. Some people are, hey, I don't give that great, you know. But, hey, just give as the Lord is leading you. That's New Testament giving. It's between you and the Lord, what he lays on your heart. It's a love gift. Let that be the motivation uh, of that. And thank the Lord we have the privilege of being in a church like this. And I can tell you this, the staff and I talk about that often. What a blessing it is to be in a church like this. 
Well, let's pray, and we'll get right back into the worship time. At the end of that, Pastor Jamie's going to come preach the great message for us. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity, as I mentioned, that we get to be in this kind of a church and the blessing that that is, your hand up on it. Thank you that we get to see people saved and baptized on a regular basis. Thank you that um, the people who attend here find you worthy of their of their lives and of their giving and of their serving. And Lord, they challenge me. So Lord, I pray you'd bless your people. Open the windows of heaven on them. I pray the group that's watching online and the people that are here, Lord, that you would just bless them richly. May we get you uh, a good glimpse of you as we look toward you tonight. Help our hearts to be open as we worship. Bless our giving. Bless Pastor Jamie as he brings the message tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. And all God's people said... Come on, church, let's stand up together. The Bible says in Romans 7, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Church, what would we do if it wasn't for the cross? Amen. Come on. I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness. If it were.
levels and mountains Carves out highways through the sea I've seen its power unravel battles right in front of me There's a faith that stands to fight It sends Goliath to his knees And I've seen his praise unravel shackles Right off my feet That's the power of your name Just a legend makes a way Giants fall and strongholds break And there is healing That's the power that I play It's the same that rolled the grave There's no power like the mind
Well, thank you, man. Thank you, Pastor Joel. Thank you, worship team. Hey, can they, they deserve a hand. Come on, y'all. Man. An incredible job. And Pastor Roy, after that introduction earlier, I'm going to have to go home and watch the service. I can't wait to hear myself. Um, <laughs> no pressure tonight at all. Hey, listen, we always... Uh, we always tell the worship team what an incredible job they do, and they do, and they deserve everything that we say about them. Um, to the guys on the cameras and the ladies that run the camera, all the ones running the screens and the sounds and, and the lights, they always do an incredible job. I want to recognize just a couple of other groups of volunteers tonight that doesn't get mentioned much, um, and that is Trent Page and Emily Sloan. They run our parking lot team, and basically, they are the parking lot team, basically, okay? Um, I don't Trent, y'all started that, what, well, I guess when we went to La Brea, is that about right? And whether it's snowing or raining, and the two days of the year that the sun is shining, they're out there doing it every single weekend, and, I mean, I just can't thank them enough for what they do, setting up the signs, dragging that little card around, putting out the cones, setting out the signs, putting out the banners, getting rained on, people driving by honking horns and letting them know they're number one in Jesus' name, and just, hey, doing it all in Jesus' name. But, Trent, thank you. I, don't, I haven't seen Emily here tonight. She may be here tomorrow, but I just want them to know we appreciate it. And you know what? You may be sitting out there thinking, you know, I'm not a people person. I don't want to do anything out front where I'm having to say a whole lot to everybody, but I wouldn't mind serving. I promise you, he'll talk to you. <laughs> he would, that might just be the area for you, but I appreciate all of that they do. And, of course, everybody that makes our church smell so good at the cafe. Oh, when you walk in the doors... I mean, not that our services are boring, but they help keep us awake, you know, and so we appreciate that, and I got to give a shout out to all of our amazing kids volunteers over here. I mean, every weekend, there's an amazing group of 40 to 50 volunteers that are over here. Now, listen, I want to clarify one thing. If you want to kind of hit a nerve with me, don't call it babysitting. We don't babysit over there. We invest in kids, okay? I'm just telling you. Um, we have volunteers over there that are pouring into our kids, sharing Jesus with them, and singing songs about Jesus, giving them Bible verses to memorize, giving them Bible stories that they go home. I hear from parents just about every week where their kids are at home and they walk by their room and they've got their stuffed animals lined up and they're teaching them the lesson that they heard or the babysitter calls and they're in there telling them we walk by and they're saying Jesus is alive or Jesus is and they're like what are they talking about? oh that was a lesson from Grace Kids over the weekend and I love hearing stories like that so I promise you these volunteers are making it happen and I appreciate every single one of them so um, but anyway, that's not why we're here tonight to hear all of that, but that is part of it. So as Pastor Roy mentioned, you know, several months ago, um, our staff began to discuss this particular series and the subject that we were going to kind of dive into here. And Pastor Roy mentioned that he would like for me to take one of the weekends and kind of speak into this. So I began to take some of my time and direct some of my studies and reading towards this topic. And and during one of those moments of reading, my mind kind of went back to a time when we lived uh, in Carrollton, Georgia. And, you know, you mentioned we've known each other about 15 years. Um, little, little bit of history here. Allison. Um, Allison, uh, his oldest daughter, and Josh was in my life group when we were in Carrollton. And uh, Josh was one of my disciples, and... and uh, your granddaughter, we were one of the first ones to get to hold them in the hospital. I've got a picture of Grace holding your granddaughter there in the hospital there. So, so yeah, we go back a little bit there. But anyway, but my mind went back to when we were in Carrollton as I was just kind of reading on this subject. And um, it, it was, I think Grace was around the age of three, uh, this particular moment that I was kind of reliving there. And I was up early in the morning, and um, 
he kind of slipped into the living room. I was in there kind of, again, it was early and was enjoying my coffee and having my quiet time. It was one of those moments of just pure pleasure that parents with a young child does not get to enjoy that often, right? Any parents in here want to relate to that with me and just say amen on that? But listen, I, I didn't have a home office at the time, but I would go there in the living room and my recliner was there and I had it by the back window and I could see out and uh, the, the, we didn't live on the golf course, but it backed up to our house. So I would tell everybody we lived on the golf course, you know, and I could see out across the golf course and the lake over there. And I just enjoyed going there and I would have my coffee, do my quiet time. And, and it was early in the morning. And again, Grace was about three. And I just remember that particular morning, she, kind, she got up out of bed and uh, come walking out into the living room, stumbling into the living room, still groggy, awake, but, you know, coming into the living room. And she just climbed up into my lap, needing my attention, nothing more but to climb into my lap and just laid her head right on my shoulder. And, you know, the warmth and the tenderness of that moment, even in a space that I had planned and had claimed for myself, it was kind of overwhelming, even after perhaps the day before being a ha she and I having a few difficult moments. Uh, you know, maybe some struggles where she wasn't listening or not necessarily obeying like we had wanted her to. The warmth and the tenderness of that moment, even in that moment that I had planned just for myself, listen, it was overwhelming. <laughs> and nothing could have made me welcome her in my chair any more than just the simple reality that she's just, she was my little girl. And as I thought about that moment, I began to ask myself, is this what the Bible means when it reveals God as our Father? If it is, then I think most of my Christian life spent in evangelical conservative movements taking doctrine and sin as seriously as possible, I think I've missed it. I failed to really reckon with the love of God. I mean, does that seem strange? Do people really reckon with God's love? I mean, shouldn't we reserve that for talking about God's wrath or his holiness or justice? I think if the idea of reckoning with God's love makes us nervous, it's not the reckoning that's wrong, but us. And so we must reckon with the love of God. Um, you know, Christians, Christians know what Jesus has done, but who is he? And what is his deepest heart for his people who are weary and faltering on their journey as we're headed towards heaven? Now, before I get too far into the message, now, I want to address the title of today's message, The Fury of God, that is, the love of God. Now, Pastor Roy mentioned this title in our Friday update, and a couple of good-hearted emails uh, were sent to me suggesting that uh, either there was a typo in the update or I was confused about the meaning of the words that I had chosen uh, in this title. But I can assure you there was neither a typo in this or that I did not misunderstand the words I chose because, see, here is the deal. I understand it sounds a little contradictory, but it was by all intents and purposes intended to be that way because when you look up the definition of the word fury, one of its meanings is fierceness, which means intense, eager. So with that in mind, I want us tonight together to consider for the next few moments the fury of God, that is, the love of God. So as we've learned over the last couple of weeks, we see just a short glimpse of the real heart of God in Matthew chapter 11, and I want us to look at that again tonight. This is where it all stems from. Matthew 11, verse 28 is where we'll pick up. It says, "'Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So there it is. We find our gentle Savior in a harsh word, a harsh world. So 
a couple of weeks ago when Pastor Roy introduced this series to us, he asked an all-important question that I feel is worthy of keeping in front of us again tonight, and that is this. Do you believe that God loves you as you are? Do you believe that God loves you as you are? You know, it's one thing, it's one thing to know the heart of God as being gentle and lowly, but it's yet another thing to see it in action. It's one thing to know it is gentle and lowly. It's a completely different thing to really see it in action. And for us to get a brief snapshot of this, listen, there's a lot of different places in the Bible that we could turn to and see this, but I want to direct us to Matthew chapter 14 and verse 14. And it says this, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. See, what we see Jesus claim with his words in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, we see him prove with his actions time and time again. We see it all through the Gospels. What he is, he does. What he is, he does. He cannot act any other way. His very life always proves his heart. A few New Testament examples of this. In Matthew chapter 8, when, when the leper comes to see Jesus and he says to him, Lord, if, if you will, you can make me clean. Well, Jesus didn't run a background check on the guy. He, he didn't look at him and say, well, you know, what, what did you do that got you into this condition to begin with? He, he didn't look at the guy and say, well, you know what? You should go over here to this clinic or you should go see this guy. No, no. Read your Bible. Look at what Jesus' response to this man is. It says he immediately stretches out his hand, touches him and says, I will be clean. Amen. Why? Why would Jesus do that? Because that's who he is. That's his heart. That is his heart in action. Go one chapter over, Matthew chapter 9. You know the story. <laughs> a group of men bring their paralyzed friend trying to get him to Jesus. But the crowd is great. And they cannot press through this crowd to get him to Jesus. So what do they do? You, you remember the story, right? They, they, they try to go this way. They can't get him. They go around this way. They can't get him there. So they do what any good group of friends do. They, they go around and they go up on the roof of the building, right? And, and they, there's no sunlight there, so they decide to make one, right? They start trying to break through the roof. I don't know if they broke out a chainsaw, an ax, or what. I don't know if they had to cut through the roof or pull back roofing. I don't know. But can you imagine Jesus inside the building? What was Jesus' response? Jesus is up there teaching and healing and all this kind of stuff, and suddenly dust particles had to start falling on him, right? And he's... <laughs> What's going on, you know? And, and all this noise and stuff. And Jesus now realizing it. He, I don't know. I, I warped mind of a kid's pastor every now and then. Okay, I confess to you. But I imagine Jesus realizes what's going on. He just steps back. He's like, oh, my people. <laughs> oh, just good old redneck people. Yeah. Open her up, boys. Let them down, you know? And, and he just steps over to the side, and there he comes. Just... And Jesus, listen, Jesus couldn't even let them get a word out. They, he didn't even wait for them to say anything. These guys go to all this trouble to cut a hole in a roof and lower the guy down. And before they can say a word, Jesus says, he, when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. He didn't even let them get to say anything. He's just like, I love you guys. Your sins are forgiven. That's awesome. I mean, he's just like, this is my heart. You guys care. He, he needs help. It's done. That is his heart in action. Why would he do that? Because it's who he is. Who he says he is is on display. He can't help but be any other way. How many times do we read in the gospel that as Jesus would travel from town to town, he would look out on the crowds and then we read the words, he had compassion or he was moved with compassion or he begins to teach them, heal their diseases. Why? That was his heart. That's his heart in action. That's the real fury of God. 
He loves those who are hurting. He loves those who are broken. He loves those who even think they have it all together. He, listen, Matthew 14, 14, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Matthew 15, 32, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have had nothing to eat. In Mark 6, 34, he had compassion on them and began to teach them many things. Luke 7, 13, and he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. All of this reflects the very heart of Christ. Now, look, I'm not going to dwell on this long tonight, but I do plan for our life groups to spend a little more time on this later this week, which, by the way, just a brief infomercial. If you're not in a life group, why not? Get in one. Listen, there is no way possible for us to ever cover everything in one sermon on the weekend that we need to cover on these subjects. That's why we have life groups. And you should get in one. Let me encourage you to do that. I don't know how some of you other life groups are. I'm just going to tell you, my life group, we love the sermon-based curriculum. There is so much content in that stuff. There is no way for us to exhaust all of it in one night. I mean, we can't get through all of it, but there are some great conversations that take place. One, I, I just got to say, this past week, there was one question in, our con, in, in, in the content there that it, it was this. It says, why is it that many people, even Christians, avoid a deep or surrendered relationship with Jesus? That, <laughs> Pastor Roy, opened up some good discussion. Um, one of the answers was, um, we don't want to give up control, <laughs> which was followed by crickets. <laughs> Nobody wanted to respond then. And then finally, somebody broke the ice and said, well, maybe we don't want to give up control because we don't really know who Jesus is, so we're afraid to give up control to him. And, and followed by more crickets, and then it just got... Listen, I know it's, that's not what we're here to hear about tonight, but I'm just telling you, get in a life group. It's some awesome discussion time. So we now return to our regularly scheduled sermon. <laughs> so we've heard, and most of us are familiar with the terminology of the Trinity, right? God the Father, Son, Spirit, all of that. So the three in one... Well, we read several times Jesus making statements like, I and my Father are one. Or, when you have seen me, you've seen my Father, right? You've, you've heard that, you've read that. So, when we read the words of Jesus in Matthew 11 saying that his heart is gentle and lowly, we can ascribe that to the heart of God as well. And we see a glimpse of this in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 34. And I want us to pick up in verse 5. We'll have it up on the screen for you. The Lord, verse 5 says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood, stood with him, him being Moses, uh, stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Now, the text that is given here uh, it, it occurs probably a dozen times throughout the Old Testament as you keep reading, and it is the basic self-description of God in the Old Testament. It is His heart, and it's the first thing out of God's mouth. It is Him setting the terms that He is merciful and gracious. He says, slow to anger, not trigger happy, all right? Slow to anger, Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. In today's terms, control, alt, delete. All right? But who will by no means clear the guilty? So he forgives sin, but this is not because he is he's morally mushy. This is not him being moral, this is not moral spinelessness, okay? And, and, and then what maybe is really perplexing as we go, continue to read, it says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the children's children to the third and fourth generation. 
Okay, and we wonder, is that God taking back everything that he just said about abounding in mercy? Is, it, is this like a divine kind of bait and switch? This is who I am. Just kidding. No, that's not what he's saying here. That's not it at all. He is the kind of God, apparently, whose judgment rolls down for generation and whose mercy rolls down a thousand generations, which is how that phrase in verse 7 could be translated where you see keeping steadfast love for thousands. Listen, in Deuteronomy, there's two different places uh, where we hear God's steadfast love rolling down to the thousandth generation, which doesn't mean when you get to generation 1001 that you're out of luck, all right? It's just a way of saying it's who he is most deeply. So judgment rolls down a couple of generations, but mercy never stops rolling down. So that's the kind of God he is. He's not the God who goes into this relationship with us with a prenup that has an off-ramp. No, it is a perfect divine commitment. That's the kind of God that we have. But now, when we think about sin in the Old Testament, the Jewish laws, every time sin takes place, that, that individual is then declared unclean or impure, all right, in the Old Testament. And when you see that, there's a sacrifice that has to be made in order for that individual to then be made clean or pure, all right? But now, before that sacrifice can be made where that individual can become clean or pure, if someone comes into contact with that person, they too become unclean or impure, and they too have to have a sacrifice in order to be made clean or to be made pure. All right, are you tracking with me here? All right, so you're following along with this cleansing process. But now when we come to the New Testament, there's something new happening here. The Jews were so accustomed to running away from what was morally disgusting, but Jesus seems to be drawn towards them. See, he went out of his way to have a conversation with a woman at a well who was broken. Amen. He went to her and met her in her brokenness. And he confronted her in her brokenness. And he drew her to himself in her brokenness. And what happened? Well, he told her, you know, he said, look, since, since you're so messed up, you can be saved, but go home. Just kind of keep it to yourself. Don't worry about it. You'll be okay. You can enjoy heaven, but because you have such a tainted past, you'll never really be able to do anything for me. You'll just get to enjoy heaven, but that's about it. That's not what happened, is it? No, he gave her living water, and she was so excited the very thing she thought she needed, she left her water pot. She was thirsty and came to get water, but when she got living water, she was so excited, she left her water pot, ran back to town, told everybody about Jesus, and changed her entire community for the kingdom of God. Why? Because he met a woman in her brokenness. He was drawn to what everybody else said. He said, no, 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 come here, come here, come here. Another, another case, one day he passed through another town, and he met this vertically challenged tax collector. By the way, that's the politically correct way of saying he was short. But he met this vertically challenged tax collector who was hiding up in a tree trying to get a good view of Jesus. And everybody else couldn't believe it because he walked by and said, hey, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come have lunch at your house today. And everybody was like, Ugh, Jesus, how dare you? That guy's a thief. He is one of the most deplorable guys in our community. Do you know how many lives that man has messed up because of his thievery? How many families he's ruined because he's taken so much money from them and he's going to go have lunch with them? Oh, I can't believe this. And they just... <laughs> and he went and had lunch with them. But later on, Zacchaeus had a change of heart. And Jesus' own word says that he declared that salvation had come to him 
That is the very fury of God. He didn't run from him. He ran to him. Jesus came to earth, and can I say it this way? He was the originator of counterculture. He was reversing the Jewish system. He didn't push away those who were morally disgusting, those who were socially outcast, those who society had given up on, those who had given up on themselves, those who live every day under a cloak of guilt and shame from their past, those who live with regrets from past relationships. No, there's something deeper in Christ's touch of compassion when Jesus the clean one touched an unclean sinner Christ did not become unclean the sinner became clean that is the difference the fury of God the love of God that moves towards touches heals embraces and forgives those who least deserves it yet truly desires it today if you're broken but so desire a right relationship with Jesus. Can I say to you tonight that he is here and he is standing in front of you tonight with arms wide open saying, come on, get in my hug. Just come here. He's waiting on you. Can I put it this way? When you read through the gospels, the testimonies of Christ is this that when he sees the brokenness of the world around him, his purest desire, his most natural instinct is to move toward that sin and suffering, not away from it. I want to direct your attention to John 6, 37. The Bible says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I'll never cast out. (laughs) Now, there's a lot packed into that one little verse. So much that John Bunyan wrote an entire book on it. (laughs) I don't have time to go through a whole book, Pastor Bill, but I'm going to try to break it down a little bit, okay? Let's look at the first word, all. (laughs) Not a few or some or the majority, but all. When God sets his sight on a sinner, you can guarantee that the rescue plan is going to be successful. But it says the Father. Now, I have to confess, this, goes quite, this, is, this is quite a different picture than the one I had of God as a teenager. I mean, as a teenager, I had this picture, Pastor Roy, of Jesus trying to hold God back, <laughs> trying to keep him from raining down on me. You know, <laughs> that fire and brimstone, Pastor Joel, that you thought I was going to bring when I came here five years ago. But <laughs> I fooled you. <laughs> But that's not, that's not God at all. Look at the following verse, if you don't believe me. Verse 38, if you have your app or your Bible open, it says, For I have come down from heaven. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Amen. He's basically saying, look, it's not just that I don't want to cast you out. My father, God, yeah, he doesn't want to cast you out either. That's why I'm here. Yeah. So whoever comes, listen, God doesn't force us into a relationship with himself. He doesn't drag us kicking and screaming against our will, but that's one of the beautiful things about grace. It reaches down and turns us around so that our very desires, and it it, it turns around our desires and it opens our eyes so that we begin to see him for who he is. We see him as a gentle savior in a harsh world as loving and kind and beautiful and we come to him and anyone whoever is welcome and then it says comes to me see it's a personal relationship we don't come to a set of rules we don't come to a set of doctrines we don't come to a church and this may sound a little edgy but hear me we don't even come to the gospel these are all vital but we come to a person. We come to Christ. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. But Pastor Jamie, you don't know everything I've done. Nope. 
But Jesus says, I'll never cast you out. Yeah, but I've really, I've really messed things up. I mean, really messed things up. It's okay. Because Jesus says, I'll never cast you out. But I can't even forgive myself for all the things I've done. It's okay. And Jesus says, I'll never cast you out. Yeah, but I've caused too much hurt to so many people. There's, there's just no way. Jesus says, I'll never cast you out. But you don't get it, Pastor Jamie. I can't fix what I've done. No one can. Jesus says he'll never cast you out. But I've messed up so much that my own family doesn't even want anything to do with me. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, but I get it. Jesus says, I won't cast you out. Will you listen to me, Pastor Jamie? Will you listen to me for just one second? I am telling you, I'm too broken. I can't be fixed. Will you listen to me for just one second? Jesus says, I will never, ever cast you out. I don't care how broken you are. I am standing in front of a room full of broken, messed up, can't be fixed people who all had a head on collision with the grace of God and realized it's okay to be broken, that it's okay to be messed up. And quite honestly, standing before you tonight is one of those people who is broken and messed up and one day had a head on collision with the grace of God. And I am standing before you tonight, broken and messed up still. And it's only by his grace that I get to stand here tonight and tell you he didn't cast me out. And I promise you, he will not cast you out either. That is our gentle Savior. It is his grace. It is his mercy that I get to present to you tonight. And he's standing here with arms wide open waiting on you tonight. There's nothing about you. There's nothing about me that we can ever hide from him. He knows everything about us. He knows the good. He knows the bad. He knows the ugly. He knows those deep down hidden secrets that we think nobody else is ever going to know about or find out except he does know about them. So let me encourage you. Tonight, there is absolutely no reason that you can give for Christ to close off his heart to you. Let that sink in. No reason exists. Now, sure, every one of us as humans, we have limits. If we get offended enough, if a relationship gets damaged enough, if we betray someone enough times, then yeah, walls can go up. But that's not the case with Christ. Amen. Not with our gentle Savior, because he is furious with us furiously in love with us and he's waiting on you saying just come get my hug see some of you you gave your heart to Jesus somewhere along the line you may have got off track and let's be honest you're a little embarrassed you're a little ashamed and you keep telling yourself that you've just messed up too much and there's no way that you can ever go back and there's no way you can ever get used well, don't tell that to King David. Amen. You know, the one that killed Goliath? Yeah, the one that also had an affair. The one that also had a guy murdered. The one who also, the Bible declared, is a man after God's own heart. Yeah, he repented. God restored. Don't tell it to Peter. Yeah, the disciple Peter, the one who lived and did life with Jesus, who was one of Jesus' closest disciples. Yeah, he denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. Abandoned the ministry. Yeah. And then after Jesus comes back, he goes and restores Peter. Peter repents. Oh, yeah. And on Pentecost, because Peter repented and got things right, God used him again. Yeah, the church has never been the same because of him. Amen. Yeah. So don't tell Peter that you can go too far and God can't restore you. You can't come back because God used him. I'm just telling you, if you've got away from God, 
You've got a gentle Savior who is furiously in love with you and saying, why don't you just come home? You've wrestled with this for too long. Why are you staying away? Why? Just come home. He's waiting on you. There's nothing he would like better. As Pastor Joel begins to play Chandler, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation here in just a minute. But see, with Christ, I want you to catch this. With Christ, our sins and weaknesses are the very resume items that qualify us to approach him. Nothing but coming to him is required. You say, but I, yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Raise your objections. But there's not one thing that can threaten these incredible words. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. We're going to sing, the altars are open. We're going to open the altars for invitation. Here's what it is. If you're running, quit running. If you've gotten away from him tonight, come home. He's here, arms wide open. Your gentle Savior is standing here saying, look, don't quit running from me because I'm coming after you. Don't run from me. Run to me. I'm here. Come on. Come get him my hug. Don't be afraid of him. He's not here to browbeat you. He's here to love on you. Pastor Joel. Can we stand up together? And I want to challenge you, church, tonight to uh, make this altar a place where you can come and lay down those burdens. Amen. You don't have to carry those burdens anymore. Let's lay them down to you. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? tonight you don't understand what it is to even come to his hug the first time you've never entered into a faith relationship with Jesus so this first part of the invitation maybe wasn't necessarily for you but I want to give those of you in here who have never trusted in Jesus as your Savior I want to give you that opportunity tonight it's very simple listen please understand there's nothing nothing you could have ever done that would ever cause him to not love you or want to forgive you. You understand that tonight. And all you have to do is be willing to understand, hey, I've sinned, I've messed up. Join the rest of us in this room. We all have. None of us in this room is better than the other one. We've all been there, done that, got the T-shirt, right? But I just want to invite you tonight, just a simple prayer of faith to understand that 
you need him as your savior to forgive you of your sins and invite him into your life to be your savior. And I want to give you that opportunity. You don't have to come forward, but you can pray that prayer right there at your seat. And if you need some help praying a prayer, you can follow a simple prayer behind me. It's not my prayer. It's not a magical little statement of words. It's your faith in him that does it. But you can pray something like this. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I desperately need you to forgive me. I believe that you love me, and I'm inviting you to be my Savior. I need you to be my Savior. I'm asking you the best way I know how by faith to forgive me, to come into my life, and make heaven my home when I die. And if you just prayed something that simple for the first time in your life and you meant it, if you just prayed something like that right now, would you just, while nobody's looking right now but me, we're not going to come to you, embarrass you in any way, shape, form, or fashion, but if you prayed that, would you just quietly raise your hand where you're at? We just want to know so we can celebrate that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just hold it up for a second so that we can see. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? God bless you. Thank you. Hey, church, everybody can look up this way. The best I could tell tonight, we had about four or five people that raised their hand tonight saying that they prayed to trust in Jesus. Hey, can we celebrate together? Let's celebrate Pastor Joel a little bit more. Sing this out together tonight. You know what I say? Church, thank you for being here tonight. What a great honor it's been and a privilege to be in the house of God. Last weekend, I was away and celebrated the life of my aunt that was 88 years old. And for 27 years, her and my uncle served in China. They taught English, but were missionaries to tell, teach people and tell people about the love of Jesus Christ. But you know, there they were not able to have a church. They'd home church, and a few people would gather at different times during the week, and it just reminds me what an honor and a privilege. We can come to the house of God and corporately worship and hear a message from God's Word that changes lives because our God changes lives. Pastor Jamie and Pastor Roy will be in the grace room just over to my right, and if you'd like someone to pray with you, I know there's many people here tonight that are broken. And it'll be an honor and a privilege. Some of our elders will be there as well. Invite somebody, tell somebody to be here tomorrow and hear this great message from Pastor Jamie. Good night. God bless you, church.